Great. So thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Christians Confronting Zionism in Times of Rising Antisemitism. It'll go on for 90 minutes. Um, we hope you can join us for the whole time. Uh, the question and answers will be during the last half hour. Uh, for those of you who might have just joined, if you're joining by phone, you can send questions to me via email at rochelle at fosna.org. It's R-O-C-H-E-L-L-E at fosna.org. And for those of you by computer, just hit the question box at the bottom and you can submit questions throughout the presentation and we'll go through those um, afterwards. We are recording this um, presentation. I just wanted to let folks know that as well. Um, and we'll uh, decide about how wide to share it at the end afterwards. And, um, I think that's everything to go over technology-wise. So I am gonna now turn it over to FASNA's Executive Director, Tarek Abuwala. Thanks. Thanks, Rochelle. Is the mic fine? Yes. Okay. Well, welcome to everyone and good to have you on this session. Um, as Rochelle mentioned, it'll go for 90 minutes and I'll share the agenda with you um, in a little bit. Um, I'm going to start out with a little introduction about FOSNA and also a little introduction about myself and our work. Um, and then we'll go with the speakers here and I'll share a little bit about them and what they're going to talk about. Um, FOSNA is a Christian voice for Palestine and it's an acronym for Friends of Sabil North America. Sabil, if anybody does not know, or most of you probably do know on this call, is a Palestinian liberation theology that was started um, by Reverend Naim Atik and others in Palestine um, to work on Palestinian liberation. Um, for us, just briefly, Fazna's work here in the U.S. has focused on multiple things, um, mainly in the past few years, um, divestment work with churches that probably some of you here on the call we've worked with, local church activism, implementation of resolutions at that local level, um, and included in that work, the importance of centering Palestinian voices and building solidarity and centering other voices of communities of color. Um, and especially this year, as we lift up Palestinian voices on the ground, marking the 10th year anniversary of Kairos this year. Um, just for uh, your future uh, information, it's fosna.org for more information, programs, projects. I'll share a bit about the programs at the end with the conclusion. In sharing with you um, who I am, why we're doing this today, why do we have these speakers? What is the importance of our coming together here? Obviously, you've taken the time out of your day or at the end of your day, some of you, depending on your time zone, um, to come and, and hear us and, and we can learn and teach each other. So this is quite important in our current political moments. Besides being the executive director of FOSNA, I'm also a gay Palestinian Christian man who lives a life of privilege in some circles um, and a life of struggles in others. And it is because of who I am that my life uh, was dedicated. It was my life that was dedicated for the past 20 years struggling with truth by doing eight years of service work in Hebron, five years of negotiations work and nonviolence trainings in Palestine on the West Bank, and 10 years of US advocacy work in churches and Christian organizations. During my time on the ground and off the ground, I have to say that I have come to know segments of the truth. And I know that this is one of the truth. I know that one of the best ways to sharpen the knife of any oppression is on the whetstone of a justice movement that hasn't done its work on that oppression. Let me just repeat that quickly. I came to know that one of the best ways to sharpen the knife of any oppression is on the whetstone of a justice movement that hasn't done its work on that oppression. And it is to share with you that it is within this vein that I do my anti-Semitic work as a Christian man and as a man who has been part of Christian institutions for the past 22 years. I've also come to know as a segment of the truth that Palestine is a spiritual opportunity and it's also a spiritual journey in our human cycles of suffering. And within that journey, it encapsulates within it the seeds of freedom for both individuals and communities alike. 
And lastly, I know that one of the best ways to rid humanity of weapons once and for all is by our working on freedom for Palestine that is built on a solid foundation on anti-oppression of any people and pro-justice for all people. So for me, Palestine is a path of truth force. Truth force, if some of you know Satyagraha or Gandhi's nonviolence force. When we don't see, where in, in this space, we don't see oppressions as competitions or other communities as enemies, but we cultivate the seeds of freedom embedded in the struggle itself and in each community as we come closer to struggle together. For me, this path that we walk is where we continue clearing weeds as we reflect on white supremacy, the tree of life massacre, Donald Trump's tweets, tweets that are featuring six-pointed star over piles of cash, and the multiple attacks on Jewish cemeteries and communities globally. It is also on this path that we open our eyes and we have to open our eyes wide open to the centuries of Christian Zionism, even in our mainline Christian churches that we've sometimes turned a blind eye to. And it is also on this same path that we come to know that Islamophobia, gender violence, queer violence, and all oppressions that surround this path also grow from the same rotten soil that includes, among others, white supremacy, male-centered theologies and dominance, Christian Zionism, and Christian dominance. So for me, being the executive director of FOSNA as a Christian voice for Palestine today with the speakers is another truth moment in that truth seeking on this path where we reflect on Christian responsibility in anti-Semitic oppressions and also a system that promulgates Islamophobia. As to remain accountable to our partners and in reclaiming our Christian values as we purify our spirits through this work. So on today, um, we will listen to our Christian brothers and sisters who understand our history as to acknowledge our continued complicities in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And on today, we will listen and hear from Jewish sisters who have been most affected by anti-Semitism and who are ready to help us parse out what is anti-Semitism, because also they are helping us to parse out what are weaponized false claims of anti-Semitism. Thanks, Jessica, for that wording, used against our justice community. So this is the hope for today as we continue. By listening to the voices, we could learn many lessons, and I challenge you to learn some of them. We can learn how to continue healing our community, how to continue mending our torn cloth of justice by working on our anti-Semitism, and as such, how to better understand the weaponized false claims of anti-Semitism that continue to be sharpened on white supremacy and Christian Zionism to attack many, and specifically women of color, Ilhan Omar, Angela Davis, Ivor Carruthers, Rashida Tlaib, etc. And we are also learning how to continue turning these weapons into plowshares so we, that we can plant our seeds in healthy soil. I want to continue clearing the weeds of Islamophobia and the blockades and the massacres in, on Gaza, the ongoing violence against Gaza this week and the occupation in territorial Palestine, but along all seeking a vision that is a larger freedom of a Palestine beyond this territorial land into what I could call an inclusive holy land. I will go over um, our agenda uh, for now with you briefly, and then I will pass it to our first speaker. Um, we will first hear from Tali Ben Daniel, um, and then, and I will introduce them in a minute, Robert Smith, and then we will take a pause to reflect on some of the things uh, they have shared with us reflected and reflected to us. Um, then we will hear from Rabbi Jessica, and also we will have a chance to do some further reflection and pausing. At that time, we'll probably be about um, the top of the hour, five o'clock central. Um, and we will go for about 27 minutes uh, for Q&A, um, and then we'll do a short closing. So that will carry us into uh, the nine minutes. So to briefly introduce Tali with her one sentence bio, Tali, 
is the research and education manager for Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, and just briefly, she will be sharing with us about some anti-Semitic tropes that show up in our Palestine work um, and some basic history of anti-Semitism as cultural form. So Tali, on to you. And each speaker will go for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, thank you so much, Tarek, and thank you so much for those beautiful opening words. I'm so happy to be here with everyone, and there's 94 people here, which feels pretty historic. Um, and so give me a second while I do a little bit of technology, because I do have a little PowerPoint for us. Um, so you can see some images and not just uh, my face the whole time. Um, is that working for folks? Okay, I see some nods for my co-presenters, so that, that's a good sign. Um, so this is a, a, this is a um, workshop that I do with college students who are working in the Palestine Solidarity Movement, mostly through Students for Justice in Palestine, but also in general, um, the college students who are working for justice and human rights for all people and have really urgent questions about how anti-Semitism operates as part of that fight. Um, and I've adapted it for, for our time together. Um, and it is a much longer workshop, so there's probably lots of things that I would want to say that I won't be able to say with everyone, but maybe we can talk about it during the uh, Q&A. So the first thing I want to say is that we are in very interesting times when we talk about anti-Semitism. Um, on the one hand, we have rising, visible, violent anti-Semitism in the United States that is manifesting primarily through this resurgent white supremacists who blame Jewish people for what they see as the decline of the United States. Um, and they have pretty much cathected onto Donald Trump as a symbol of how to make America great again. At the same time that we have the Donald Trump have a very close and personal, friendly and warm relationship with um, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. And we can see both the United States and Israel really strengthening their alliance um, as, as both countries move towards the right in terms of their governance. And I think for many people, this is actually quite confusing, especially because we are taught to conflate the state of Israel with the Jewish people. It's confusing that we have both rising anti-Semitism and a stronger alliance with Israel. Now, for those of us working for justice in Palestine, this is not maybe <laughs> quite as confusing as um, for folks who haven't um, done that work. But I still think that this is important context to keep in mind as we analyze some of the ways anti-Semitism might show up um, in our lives. So this is a workshop that I've, um, some definitions of anti-Semitism that I've pulled from the book that JP put out called On Anti-Semitism and from a resource that Jews for Racial and Economic Justice based in New York developed called On uh, um, uh, Understanding Anti-Semitism. So anti for J. French, anti-Semitism originates in European Christianity and it's the form of ideological oppression that targets Jewish people. And for JVP, we understand anti-Semitism as discrimination against violence towards stereotypes of Jews for being Jewish. These are very, very simple explanations. Um, and what I want to do is focus on a couple of the aspects of the ways that anti-Semitism can show up um, in, our, in, our, in our lives and also when we advocate for Palestinian human rights. Um, the first thing I want to do is actually a little bit of like a disclaimer. Uh, my family is from Iraq. Um, it's, I think it's super important as we think and talk about anti-Semitism to really keep in mind that Jewish people are a multi-ethnic and multi-racial group of people. Um, there are many Jewish people who are not white and that there are white Jewish people. And so that we want to make sure that we're separating ideas of race from um, Jewishness and not, I think one thing that happens is we sort of assume that all Jewish people are white or all Jewish people are wealthy or all Jewish people are one thing. And so that's one sort of important thing to keep in mind as we are um, uh, doing this work. The second thing to keep in mind is that most of our understandings in the United States about who Jews are, um, are based on ideas of Ashkenazi Jewish people. Ashkenazi Jewish people are Jews who can trace their ancestry to Europe, um, and uh, Jews who can trace their ancestry to, um, to the Middle East um, are called either Sephardi or Mizrahi. 
Um, Sephardi means, uh, is, a, is a way to pe let people transfer their ancestry to Spain. So often people who went wherever Spain did in colonization are, can also um, call themselves Sephardi. It is a tiny bit confusing. Um, but most of the Jews in the United States are Ashkenazi. And so most of our understandings of what Jewish culture is, what Jewish foods are, are Ashkenazi foods. And so just another thing to keep in mind as we're um, thinking about these, these issues. I wanted to start with two things in European history that I think are really important to highlight, and I'm sure my co-presenters will also talk about um, some variations of these things, um, that the history of anti-Semitism in Europe is, is you know, um, a long history. Uh, and before we had this idea called anti-Semitism, there was anti-Jewish sentiment that was based on religious um, ideas about that, you know, primarily that everyone should be Christian, and so therefore Jews were not Christian, <laughs> should be converted into Christianity. Um, and um, two sort of anti-Semitic canards that really produced a lot of violence against Jewish people throughout history and can still kind of show up in some ways. Um, I wanted to highlight through these images. The first um, on the right here is um, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which some of you may have heard of which was an anti-Semitic text uh, produced in Russia in the, in the early, early 20th century. Um, and it was disseminated internationally as in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and it was supposed to be these minutes from these notes of uh, Jewish leaders discussing their goal of global domination by subverting morality, by controlling the press, and by controlling the world's economies. Um, and those, that it was a it was a hoax, right? But those um, stereotypes really took on a life of their own and um, fueled a lot of anti-Semitic violence in Russia, where the text was produced, and all over the world. Um, so you can see the image of um, the man with his fingers in the globe, right? That so um, one way we see a contemporary version of this is the word globalist, um, or the ways that people talk about George Soros. If you're aware of those. Um, anti-Semitic stereotypes. This idea that Jewish people control the world or are somehow behind, um, nefariously plotting behind uh, world events. The second um, anti-Semitic uh, image here is um, an image of blood libel, which is an accusation of Jewish people kidnapping, murdering, bloodletting Christian children in order to use their blood in religious ritual. Um, and I also wanted to include this because this was an unsubstantiated rumor that took on a life of its own and produced and fueled a lot of violence against Jewish people throughout time. Um, and both of these, because they operate on the level of rumor, I wanted to highlight because so much of how we understand, how I understand anti-Semitism working today is through conspiracy theory and through rumor. So the, the other thing I wanted to take a moment to, to discuss is where we get this word anti-Semitism from. Um, so the word Semitic uh, is an old 19th century word that describes a family of languages that includes Arabic and Hebrew and Assyrian. Um, this was a part of the 19th century in Europe when European thinkers were using science in order to categorize people racially. Um, and that kind of thinking is what fueled colonialism and slavery and many of the ways that we see inequality manifesting in our contemporary lives right now comes from this moment in time where these racial classifications were seen as evidence for why certain people deserved land and rights and other people didn't. Um, so it quickly became a race, right? Semitic wasn't just a lack, because of this, this kind of thinking, it quickly became attached to race and to racial classifications and not just language. There was a journalist named William Marr who was an anti-Semite and who believed that um, Jewish people, a, he, was in, he lived in Germany, he believed that Jewish people um, in the 19th century were going to undermine uh, uh, Germany as a country. And so he wrote a pamphlet called The Way of Victory of Judaism Over Germanism which was quite popular. And he popularized the term anti-Semitism as a way to combat the influence of Jewish people on German society. Um, and the thing to really understand here is that Jews were seen as intrinsic outsiders, right? So Jewish people in, in, these, in Europe were kind of caught between two 
um, terrible positions, right? One, if they assimilated, they were seen as never fully assimilating, right? They were seen as somehow insidiously inside the society and would influence the society to evil ends. And if they didn't assimilate, they were seen as alien outsiders um, and has, could never fully be incorporated into the, um, into the nation. Uh, and I think this is really important to highlight because I think we see a really similar structure at play when we talk about Islamophobia in this country, um, that where uh, Muslim people are seen as both um, never fully able to assimilate into American culture, but also as outsiders. And we can see this very clearly with the backlash against Ilhan Omar, um, who uh, is, you know, being targeted for wearing a hijab, being targeted for being Muslim. Um, uh, and there's other, I think, very obvious examples as well. In the 20th century, Nazis took on this race science and, um, and weaponized it and made it uh, part of their genocidal program uh, in Germany. Um, and one thing I wanted to highlight, this is some of the sort of um, Nazi uh, cartoons that happened in newspapers in Germany is the sort of very visible difference between wh who, we, who we are supposed to identify as Jew, as a Jewish person in these cartoons and who we're supposed to identify as a non-Jew in these cartoons. And so it was very racialized, it was very embodied, right, in the body that Jewish people were radically different than German people. I wanna take a small moment just to say that um, Jews in the Muslim and Arab world had a really different experience. Um, I'm not saying there wasn't any anti-Jewish sentiment, but it wasn't um, codified in the same way that it was in Europe and it wasn't, um, the, just the histories are quite, quite, quite different. Many Jewish people in the Arab and Muslim world had pretty integrated histories um, and, uh, you know, there was definitely a thread of anti-Jewish sentiment, but it wasn't quite the same, I think is the, is the short version of what I want to say. Um, and I strongly recommend reading work by Ella Shohat, who is an Iraqi Jewish thinker and who um, has uh, some of this history in her work. So um, can I get a brief time check? Just how much more time I have? Two minutes, 10 minutes, who knows? You have about um, four minutes. Great, perfect. Okay, I can do it. Um, so I want I'll, I'll, I'll be quite quick about this. I'm sure my other co-presenters will have a lot to say. Um, it, I think I wanted to sh highlight just two ways anti-Semitism works in our contemporary United States, right? First is through Christian hegemony, which is the, the everyday and pervasive ways that Christian values and beliefs dominate our society. Um, and that this uh, influence, this is a, a thing that impacts everyone, not just Jewish people, right? So a very classic example is that Christian holidays are recognized officially by, in the United States, but that people who don't celebrate Christian holidays, their holidays are not recognized. And the other way that it works is through conspiracy. Um, and this is from a, a, an essay I really enjoyed, The Nation by Talia Lavin. Um, but I thought this sentence was quite instructive. It's a postulation of nefarious transnational control by Jews of institutions inspired by malevolence and kind of unique to us as a people. So this is what we see very much in the George Soros conspiracy, for example. And this is a really anti-Semitic flyer that was found on, a, on several campuses this last year. Um, and I, I'm using it as an example because um, part of what these anti, these white supremacists theories, like what's behind them is they're, you know, hateful of many groups of people, right? They're hateful against um, Muslim folks, against gay folks, against women, against, you know, they're, they're um, uh, immigrants, like all of the other, they're very hateful against multiple groups of people. But for them, Jewish people are behind a lot of the things that they hate that are happening in the United States. So um, every time some anti-white, anti-American, anti-freedom event takes place, look at it and behind it's Jews behind it. And this was around the Kavanaugh hearings, for example. Another sort of way that we see anti-Semitism show up is through Donald Trump, um, who has had some pretty anti-Semitic things in his campaign in 2016 and also um, you know, throughout his life. Um, but here we can see an image of Hillary Clinton and a Jewish star and then money in the background. And it's both subtle and completely not subtle at all, knowing the history of anti-Semitism. 
And I think um, one thing I want to make super clear, um, and this is an image from a protest in New York, is that anti-Semitism um, is one of the things that holds up white supremacy, which oppresses all of us and, and sort of bolsters the U.S.-Israel um, relationship. Um, and I know that Rabbi Jessica is going to um, talk through this in great detail, um, but I think the something to just sort of move, say really quickly and, and is just that we have to call out conflation um, and be very clear that the state of Israel does not equal Judaism and that not all Jews support Israel and not who support Israel are Jews. Um, and then when we, when we do that conflation, that hurts the fight against anti-Semitism and racism and Islamophobia. Um, I'm gonna skip making you listen to Mike Pence um, to get to this slide. <laughs> Um, which is uh, some examples of anti-Semitism that could show up as you're fighting, as people fight for Palestinian rights or um, talk about Israel. There are ways that one can um, try to talk about Israel, try to talk about the U.S.-Israel relationship, try to talk about the fight for Palestinian liberation and um, trigger anti-Semitism. Um, this does often get weaponized, so it becomes very challenging to tell the difference between what is a weaponization of anti-Semitism and what might be anti-Semitism. So this is not a complete list. This is just a list to help people start thinking about it. Um, so randomly interrogating Jewish people on their position, assuming Jews are Zionists until proven otherwise, uh, holding all Jews accountable for the actions of Israel, using Zionists as a stand-in for Jewish and using Z Jews and Zionists simultaneously, and indulging in conspiracies about Jewish power, Zionist media, Rothschild, those sorts of things. And I think one thing I really want people to take away from this list is this conflation between the state of Israel and Jewish people as something that's really harmful for Jewish people and um, for our fight for liberation for all people. Um, so just some questions to think about as you move through our fellow, our fellow speakers. Um, if you've ever heard anything that might be anti-Semitic and remain silent, what prevents us from speaking up when we hear something anti-Semitic? And what would support us in speaking out when we hear or see something anti-Semitic? Thank you guys, I hope I kept to my time. Thank you very much, Tali, much appreciated. I know it takes an intrinsic centered power to share about the oppression of one's own community. It also takes some internal energy, so thanks for sharing both the power and the energy with us. Um, it was the yeah, important lessons on diversity of the Jewish community, historical backgrounds of anti-Judaism and Semitism. And when you mentioned um, the words intrinsic outsiders, and was it alien outsiders, intrinsic outsiders and alien outsiders, it reminds me of the, also of um, how Christianity, which is what Robert will also address, be considering Jews as theological allies and otherness as well in, in, in the same time. So how that plays out biblically and theologically for Christianity um, internally and how that's also part and parcel of uh, mainline also uh, denominations work. So next is Robert Smith. He is an ELCA pastor and researcher with extensive experience in Israel and Palestine. He's the author of More Desire Than Our Own Salvation, The Roots of Christian Zionism. Robert, did you point to your book right above your shelf yet? There you go. <laughs> Very strategic marketing. That's excellent. I love it. <laughs> so Robert would address, as I was saying earlier, um, the theological allies and otherness um, of, 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 of Jews uh, in, in, in Christian theology. Uh, history and ties to anti-Semitism and Christian anti-Judaism and, and get more details with that. So Robert, go for it for another 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tarek. And, and thanks to all the uh, presenters and all participants in this important conversation. It's uh, an honor to be a part of this, uh, this panel today and an honor to be a part of FASNA's efforts to raise awareness of these important questions and to foster self-critical approaches among activist communities so we can be precise and responsible in our speech and build as many allies as possible in the cause of justice. So Christian Zionism is, can, can be a somewhat confusing topic for people. Uh, there are many different ways to describe what the movement is. And so one of the things I like to do is begin with a definition 
my definition of Christian Zionism that, that informs the book. And uh, the, the definition I've offered is that Christian Zionism is political action informed by specifically Christian commitments to promote or preserve Jewish control over the geographic area now comprising Israel and Palestine. I'll repeat that. Uh, Christian Zionism is political action informed by specifically Christian commitments to promote or preserve Jewish control over the geographic area now comprising Israel and Palestine. One of the big questions is why would there be a Christian theological commitment to that Jewish political control? And that, that's one of the, the deeper questions when we get into the study of Christian Zionism. Now, Christian Zionism is a contemporary reality, but it's not only contemporary. It's very much a part of the Trump administration and its orbit. Uh, Tally all uh, threatened to make us listen to Mike Pence. Uh, he is very much uh, in this vein of Christian Zionism and is a chief Christian Zionist today. Um, but it's in all expressions of American Christian churches because there's something deeply American about this movement, especially Anglo-American. And I, I, uh, I want to make the assertion today that this concern, not just anti-Semitism, but Christian Zionism, isn't about those people over there. It's about every Christian in the United States. We're all implicated in these ways of thinking, and, and I, I would like us to grapple with that. Christian Zionism is not a new movement at all. It, it, the first clear example of political Christian Zionism, as opposed to Judeocentric Christian theology, is from January 1649 among English Puritans. So this movement has been in a fully formed mode for a very long time. Those ideas were imported into North America, what became the United States, by English Puritan settlers. They created New England, and with it, the foundations of what it means to be an American, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant American. And there we get, again, to Tally's question of insider-outsider. This idea of who is truly American was formed alongside Christian Zionist commitments. So Christian Zionism isn't just about Jerry Falwell or John Hagee or Christians United for Israel. It's about the foundations of American identity itself. If you are American, these ideas inform part of who you are, the dominant culture of the United States, whether you embrace it or react against it. Uh, this is part of the, the air we breathe in, in the North American context. Many people know deep down that Christian Zionism is compatible with anti-Semitism. One of the, when I first started studying Christian Zionism as an academic, uh, I, I was able to meet with uh, Amira Haas, one of the journalists who works for Haaretz. And when I, I approached her about the question of Christian Zionism, and she just dismissed me, she said, they're all bloody anti-Semites. The question is, how do we dig deeper into that, that gut feeling, that, re, that rejection feeling, and figure out how these things can be so compatible? One of the things I've talked about is how every expression of Christian Zionism is about constructing Jews for Christian purposes. Constructing Jews for Christian purposes. This uses an entire community of people as a means to a Christian end. It's a fundamentally unethical way of encountering humanity. Now, if you think that's shocking, then think about how these Christian Zionists then have no trouble constructing or destroying Palestinian communities. So these are, are the same, uh, two sides of the same Christian Zionist coin. Now, it was true in the Reformation context of the 16th and 17th centuries, when Protestants were struggling against Catholics and Muslims, that Jews were constructed by Christians as mythological allies. It was true then, and it's true today, as the West, that is Western Christian civilization, struggles against Muslims still. So we have this, this long-standing construction of Jewish allies against Islamic enemies. European political Zionism, when it was inaugurated by Theodor Herzl, could not have succeeded without pre-existing and robust Christian Zionist support. At that time, in the form of William Heschler, 
who escorted Herzl into the halls of Austro-Hungarian imperial power. European and Euro-American Christians have been directly implicated in every stage of Zionist development. Without Christian Zionists, there would not have been any political Jewish Zionist success. Christians are implicated. Broadly speaking, I want to step back to a more theological point, that Christian anti-Judaism is endemic to Christianity itself. Early Christian differentiation from Judaism led to supersessionist theology. Now, this is true in the text of the New Testament itself. We look at the book of Hebrews, a classical a supersessionist text, uh, that, that Jesus has come with a better covenant to replace the old covenant. But those, the, those ideas were part of the self-differentiation of Christian communities. They became dangerous when Christians gained power as the official theology of the Constantinian Empire. And that power dynamic remains. And that we heard Tali mention the concept of Christian hegemony, Christian domination of Western society and culture, which again fits with the ability to shape other communities' realities to fit your preferences, that other communities are there to serve your needs. This is an expression of Christian hegemony that fits Christian Zionism to a T. Harold Bloom, the literary critic, once said that it's an old Yiddish remark that the Christians stole our watch 2,000 years ago and are still telling us what time it is. So that's Christianity in general, but it's Christian Zionism in particular, because it's still telling Jews, this is how you will serve my purposes. And I will, I'm in a transactional relationship with you. I don't care about your community for its own desires, needs, and purposes, I care about your community because of how it serves me. And that, that transactional, very cynical relationship remains at the heart of Christian Zionism today. I have to say, though, that supersessionism always comes with anxiety for those claiming to supersede. It's possible that Christian claims simply aren't true. The continued existence of Jews and Judaism could be seen as challenging the verifiability of Christian claims. And that anxiety produce, has produced tremendous violence throughout history. As Tali said, the 19th century gave birth to philo philological and racial classification systems. All of it had a direct effect on Christian theology and public philosophy, most explicitly in Germany, but not limited to Germany. Specifically, German theologians, though, sought to sever Jesus from any Jewish heritage or foundations because of this relentless desire to have a supersessionist Christianity. The rush to embrace Judaism among Christian Zionists through philo-Semitism is another way to address this Christian anxiety, to make sense of continued Jewish existence. I think that the challenge for Christians today is to produce theologies that recognize Judaism, reject supersessionist supremacy, and accept the plurality of human responses to God's presence in the world. No theology that constructs another theologically formed or ethnically formed community for its own purposes can be ethical and can be the will of God. And so we need to revamp our entire approach to theology in the post-Holocaust era to produce liberative theological reflection that allows for the existence of all human communities, not simply placing our own on top. Anti-Semitism and its underlying reality of Christian anti-Jewish theology and philosophy is a Christian problem for which Christians need to take responsibility. The Islamic world uh, is filled with Western anti-Semitic content, often uncritically repeated. You see the Protocols of the Elders of Zion translated into Arabic, but these are Western ideas kind of adopted lock, stock, and barrel uncritically into, uh, into Arabic discourse. But this is really a gift of Western Europe to the Arabic-speaking world. Um, so we, we have to recognize our complicity and, and participation in these processes. In the same way, 
Zionism can be understood as a manifestation of white Western settler colonialism, a form of coloniality in which the arriving population comes to stay at the expense of the indigenous population that happened in the United States, in New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and in the state of Israel. But this is a structure inaugurated by European Christian culture, not something generated first and foremost by Jews. Jews adopted these structures for various historical reasons, reasons related to communal survival, again, because of Christian horror. And if we don't recognize that we are part of the same structure, then we risk blaming Jews alone for this reality in Israel and Palestine. That simply isn't the case. So spreading around the complicity is actually one way to reduce anti-Semitic content, to make sure that you recognize your, your role in this and your society's role in this. One other piece I'd like to, to raise up is this idea of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Christian Zionism is really uh, another expression of the, Judeo the Judeo-Christian concept uh, blown up to its most weaponized form. Uh, Arthur Cohen wrote an essay in 1969 that he revised and published again in 1970 called The Myth of the Judeo-Christian Tradition. And he, the Judeo-Christian tradition, Cohen said, is an exhibition of what Solomon Schechter called higher anti-Semitism, in which the Jewish experience is retained rather like a prehensile tale in the larger and more sophisticated economy of Christian truth. In implicit agreement with, uh, with uh, Arthur Heller, who had criticized Paul Tillich in 1952, and Tillich is one of our leading German liberal theologians in the United States, Cohen seeks to liberate Judaism from Christian domination because he notes that there can be no free Jewish reality as long as it is obliged in dialectical relation and tension with Christian history. The question for Jewish liberation is to free Jews and Judaism from having to define themselves in relation to Christianity. Shaul McGee suggests through Arthur Cohen that the Judeo-Christian concept is really a tool of domination that invites the Jew to join American exceptionalism by reframing her own exceptionalism in the service of America. Again, you see how Jews are invited to construct their efforts for my benefit, for your benefit, not their own. And then finally, Gil Hochberg, who teaches at UCLA and at Columbia, expands beyond Shaul McGee by offering the possibility of not just disaggregating the Judeo-Christian hyphen, but in crafting a new Jewish Islamic alliance to resist what she calls the fantasy by which we must actively forget and displace the long European legacy of colonialism, racism, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism. That the, the history of Jewish, uh, Jewish and Islamic tension is actually bound up with the history of Christianity and that there is no natural conflict between these communities. All of this is subsumed under Christian Zionism today, because Christian Zionism in its American and European forms is a forceful attempt to reassert the Judeo-Christian Judeo concept as an imperial, military, industrial, and religious unit of ideology. The challenge we have is to allow Jews to exist as Jews, to allow Palestinians self-determination to exist as Palestinians, to seek liberation for all communities, and to do so through the practice of Christian humility, knowing that we have neglected that humility through our millennia of existence. Today, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and in, in our in our Christian efforts toward liberation theology, we too often think of Christian Zionists as those people over there. We don't, in my assessment, fully accept our responsibility and complicity in those same systems of domination and control. 
The responsibility we have is to recognize our own complicity so we are not just pointing out the speck in our neighbor's eye, but addressing the log protruding from our own. So I'm happy to be part of this conversation. I look forward to further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I love just bringing it always back to our own backyards, our own churches, our own countries, and understanding it as an ecological system of oppressions based on constructions of allyship for the time, for the time period, and how differentiations could be turned to weapons against the quote unquote, the past and its formation in the other. Uh, but thank you also for your vision for inclusive theologies and liberation that you started to scratch the service on. Um, I kept forgetting to mention that Tari and Webb uh, will not be joining us, uh, as is obvious, um, uh, because he is actually sick. Uh, so we just uh, hope for and pray for his recovery. At this point, we're going to take a minute and a moment to just pause and reflect. A lot has been said by myself, by Robert, by Tali, a lot to be processed. We'll not be taking Q&A right now. We'll be taking them in about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but what we are doing are reflecting on two things, and I'm going to read them out here. Um, reflect. Um, on example or examples of how do these tropes we've heard some about appear in our own language. So stop and reflect for a moment when you, your organization, found yourself relying on anti-Semitic tropes to make your case about anti-Zionism. And part of it could be reflecting on Christian Zionism assumptions embedded in our own theology. Uh, and reflected in our American culture. So let's take a moment just to write down, I'm gonna give us one full minute here um, to just reflect on it before we go to Rabbi Jessica and then into Q&A. And of course, as we um, uh, share this webinar later, or as you're taking notes, however you want to reflect on it later, I know one minute is nothing. It's just taking a break uh, to possibly start just to kind of let it settle in um, and, and to start digesting it perhaps. Um, so next, we will go to Rabbi Jessica Rosenberg, who is a member of the Jewish Voice for Peace Rabbinical Council and Philadelphia chapter. She became a rabbi in order to learn diverse and nuanced histories and create spaces, ritual, and organizing that help transform our relationship to past, present, and future. And with that, I will pass it on to you, Jessica. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, just want to start saying I'm so grateful to be here. I just have so much respect for Fazna, um, I was really blessed to be at the gathering in, in the fall, and I'm just really honored to be deepening um, to getting to know staff and leaders in Fazna and to be building with y'all. So um, at JVP, at Jewish Voice for Peace right now, we're doing a lot of work to examine racism and oppression uh, internally in our organizing and in our organization, and specifically white and Ashkenazi members of JVP are working to listen, incorporate feedback, and grow from some real talk feedback that um, Jews of color, Sephardi, Mizrahi Jews, um, and Palestinian partners have been giving us, and um, working on how to 
dedicate time and resources on accountability and anti-racist learning and skill building. Um, so just to say like the, um, this learning about like how do we wrestle with oppression uh, internally in our organizing and uh, is really important work that's happening in lots of places and I'm really grateful. I'm grateful for the um, time that you all are taking and um, honored to be part of cross movement work to examine uh, our places, places where we need to learn and grow. So coming out of all of what Tarek and Kelly and Robert just offered us about the context of anti-Semitism and Christian hegemony and Christian Zionism, uh, the question then is how do we continue to take bold action for justice in Palestine, centering the leadership of Palestinians, um, given given this context um, and all else, while we're also thinking about gender oppression and racism um, and, and all that we're swimming in. So um, I will share some of my thoughts and also just to say like this, the kind of like practical application Kelly and Robert had the easy part. They just got to like redo history. Everybody knows what happened. And now I'll take on the like, what do we do? Which I have some ideas about. I'm just kidding. They did really hard work there about difficult history. Um, but the, the question about like, what do we do? Um, I will offer some thoughts and then I'm really excited to think with, um, with everyone. So just to say, I know that Christians who take action for justice in Palestine are called, often called anti-Semitic um, because everyone who takes action for justice in Palestine is called anti-Semitic sooner or later. And my two kind of like main points that I want to lay out is keep doing it, keep taking bold action and be involved in campaigns, keep organizing in your churches and your streets, be loud in our streets, um, keep taking action when you're called anti-Semitic. And also, we all have a lot of work to do on, on learning anti-Semitism. Um, when we're called out on anti-Semitism, especially I'll say for folks organizing in a church, uh, it's really important to acknowledge anti-Semitism as a historical and systemic oppression that white European Christians are uh, have historically been responsible for um, and have a lot of work to do, as Robert and Holly laid out. Um, to to challenge. Um, and I want to suggest that we have work to do, and especially for folks organizing um, from churches, to do work to unlearn anti-Semitism even before, um, even before being called out in a specific way um, or being accused in a specific way. So um, I'm going to go into a little more details, but that's like, those are my two big keep working for justice in Palestine, we all have to, and also keep unlearning anti-Semitism um, in the same way that we keep unlearning racism, Islamophobia, misogyny, all the things. So um, how do we talk about Zionist influence and power? So anti-Semitism asserts that um, Jews hold power and influence over US policies, really over world governments, as, as Tali laid out. Um, and that's not true. Um, it is historically has been and continues to be white Christian men who have the resources and power to control U.S. policies. Um, even among uh, Jews who do have, you know, have power, it's not all Jews. Um, it is again primarily they're, you know, they're uh, not all Jews are um, class privileged and white and men and Zionists. Um, uh, traditional anti-Semitism inflates Jewish power to offset the responsibility of um, and cover the, the visibility of who has real power and to place it all on Jews. Um, and like racism serves to divide uh, oppressed people so that we can't come together and fight who um, and powerfully fight who actually is holding power. Um, so when we're talking about the um, Israel lobby, um, and I'm going to um, be citing some things from a recent article that came out, APAC isn't the whole story um, that I can share, that I'll share in the chat. Um, but just to, to name the defense industry as a whole spent 64 million um, on lobbying um, in 2018. Uh, Boeing, the largest center, center budgeted 15 million on lobbying. Um, APAC spent 3.5 million on lobbying during the same, same period. KUFI, Christians United for Israel, um, is actually the largest pro-Israel group. So when we think about why APAC gets so much attention, 
There's five, over 5 million members in Christians United for Israel, and APAC claims roughly 100,000 members by comparison. Um, so that's just like when we are calling out the Israel lobby, when we're calling out um, the very real and powerful forces that are um, influencing US policy in regards to Israel, um, just how important it is to um, not fall into the anti-Semitic trap that it's Jews who are controlling that, um, both because it's an anti-Semitic trap and also because it's not accurate. Um, and we want to make our organizing uh, strategic um, and having, you know, centering that, um, bringing that analysis is important for that. Um, it's also just to say that when we um, focus on Jewish power um, and when we focus on Jewish Zionists more than Christian Zionists, that, that plays into the propaganda that to be Jewish equals to be Zionist. Um, making Christian Zionists more visible will help Jewish anti-Zionists be actually be more visible and seem less out there. Like that we, um, it's even, I mean, it's funny to me, we say like Zionists and Christian Zionists as if to be Zionist is a default Jewish position, but not a default Christian position. So like Christian Zionism gets the special phrase. Um, whereas as uh, Robert laid out, like Christian Zionism is also a, a default kind of that, you know, like that's um, pretty common there. So um, uh, in how we're talking about Zionist influence and power to be naming Christian Zionism, to be naming the um, military lobby, um, and for Christians to be opposing Christian Zionism um, strategically um, is a really important part, I think, of where our organizing needs to go right now. So I want to address, um, I know that it is very common, um, probably most people on this call have experienced getting um, anger and pushback um, directed at them for doing Palestine solidarity work, and it can be really intense and really personal. Um, and I know that because it happens to me as well, um, and all of the, uh, really, I think everybody who's taking public stance for Palestine has dealt with some, um, has dealt, dealt with public pressure about that. Um, and also just to name that it's Muslim and Arab students on campuses who are, um, by far getting um, the worst of that, um, where there's really horrendous um, mechanisms in place to uh, attack Muslim and Arab students and um, hurt their job prospects and just like really deeply impact their lives. Um, uh, and that, yeah, that's, that is awful and is something that we're gonna be, that we need to, um, spend time on, you know, how do we support those students? Um, so there's a kind of like very uh, structured mechanisms of, or like very, you know, like resource mechanisms of attacking people when they um, stand up for justice in Palestine. And then there's also the kind of more casual or personal relationships. Like we have all um, have friendships or family member relationships or colleague relationships that have been impacted. Um, as I was thinking about how to kind of ad address this on the call, um, somebody pointed me towards uh, JVP. One of our guiding principles at, at JVP is the capacity for people to change. So I'm gonna read that, because um, I should be reading it more often and believing that people can change. Foundational to our work for justice and peace is believing people, organizations, and communities are dynamic. We create space for people to move and transform. We encourage continual learning, skill development, and political education for people to evolve in their thinking and deepen their investment in action to realize justice for all people. So, to think, so we, I, I mean, there's like the very like structured attacks on people, and then there's also just like the very daily. How do we work with? Um, or, you know, if you're organizing in a church and there's a synagogue that you had a relationship with, um, that um, gets really angry or upset when you take action for justice in Palestine. Um, how do we bring this principle that we believe that people can move and transform? So I want to suggest that it's really important to do some assessment of a relationship, especially if it's an organization-to-organization -organization relationship, 
if your local Jewish community and um, kind of like self-proclaimed local Jewish leaders are getting angry about uh, action, Palestine solidarity action you're taking, um, I think it's really important to learn about the Jewish landscape um, in the in the place and really learn about the whole faith community landscape in the in the place where you are. There, like, yes, 100%, the vast majority of Jewish organized mainstream institutional weight is unequivocally supportive of Israel. That is, that's true about mainstream Jewish organized life right now. And within that, there is actually a lot of diversity um, between the different movements, between different synagogues, different rabbis and leaders, and different Jewish communities in different places. And I'm not saying that everyone everywhere has to like learn every detail about every Jewish community, but I would suggest that in your local context, knowing um, where people are, um, and you know, I, know I think like uh, in a lot of Palestine solidarity spaces, we we talk about liberal Zionists and uh, as, as not very different from uh, not liberal Zionists um, and like in individual relationships that like might be someone who is open to hearing more or moving someday somehow um, and I will say like things are shifting very like shifting all the time um, and if we are strategic we can help them shift more um, it might strain relationships for years. People might walk away from partnerships that you've um, been a part of. Um, and I think it's really important to take the long view. So it's okay to say, we're really sorry to see you go from this collaboration. And I'm going to call you again in a year. Um, and then again in two years. And then again in three years. Um, uh, how can we, yeah, I want to encourage us to think about, about the long game, both in individual relationships and in organizational relationships. I want to lift up the slide that um, Tali showed about ways that anti-Semitism does show up in movements for uh, justice, and um, we've got we've got work to do. So as as I said at the beginning, we want to like keep doing our organizing, and we also all need to learn about anti-Semitism and challenge it in ourselves um, and uh, in our organizing, um, and do that alongside all of the anti-oppression work we're doing. Um, I think one some really important I'll give you three things that I'm trying to do. Um, it's really great to oppose the action and not the people. So like when we talk about the conflation of Jews and Zionism, um, it's, you can oppose the actions. Um, you can also like work to name the political system um, without, uh, without like these Zionists doing that, you know, like these Jews, these Zionists, like um, constructing sentences that way. Um, it is really important to know the Jewish stereotypes or the stereotypes of Jews that Tali laid out um, and to watch them um, and to be mindful of how, how, you, how we talk um, and to not reiterate Jewish stereotypes, um, even if in the moment it seems like what you're saying, you know, is a true thing. I think like when you, when you learn, um, learn about Jewish stereotypes and think about how, how, we're, how we're talking about, about Jews. Um, um, and then I will also say that um, I think there was something on the slide about um, making all Jews uh, answer for Israel or talk about Israel right within the like first five minutes of meeting them, not making Christians do that, um, especially given the history of um, Christian Zionism. I would also say like um, when you think about when you think about partnerships, um, I experience a lot of like especially in progressive movements like oh we're gonna as we're talking about partnerships jewish organizations are immediately suspect in a way that christian organizations are not um which um given the history of christian zionism is something to investigate um and within all of that just to say like friend you losing friendships and relationships um hurt <laughs> just to really acknowledge um that 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 has an impact um, and that's part of why um, having our movement spaces be places where we can um, actually bring our real selves and build real relationships um, and support each other um, is really important to me. Uh, so yeah, that's, those are some of my thoughts on um, how confronting Zionism um, and uh, given this political context and, and this time, I'm really um, honored to 
excited to hear what other folks have to say. Thanks, Rabbi Jessica. Um, and for highlighting also the importance of no community is a monolithic community. Prophetic justice is to be found in all communities, uh, albeit it's probably sparse in all communities because uh, it goes against the uh, status quo. And how do we as um, Christians take um, responsibility and accountability for countering the message of you named five million members in Kufi, Christians United for Israel, five million members who are meeting this summer in D.C. Um, so with that, I would encourage you, and Rochelle will share the link, to become a member of FOSNA, uh, because we would like to plan a convening for the summer in witness of um, that space, in witness of Kufi, Christian United for Israel, um, and we will share more information with you as a member and also to plug in a couple of programs, which is our Clergy and Seminary Action Council. If you are a pastor, a priest, a nun, um, a leader in your um, church, Christian institution, you are welcome to sign on to that. We have about 170 persons that stand up in witness uh, when these things are happening and we need those voices to speak out constantly. Um, also, the Faith and Freedom Justice Project that is building um, with historically black churches um, and colleges in uh, cross-movement solidarity collective building, um, and that is led by um, Tarian Webb and Niall Fort. And lastly, you can also find it online for the HP Free Church and YHP. There's a whole presentation on YHP and what you can do to make your church an HP Free um, Church. With that, I will move it to um, Rochelle to carry us into the 20 minutes of Q&A. Great, thanks. And I just want to remind folks, if you'd like to ask a question and you're on the computer, you can just go down to the bottom center of your screen and hover and you will see the Q&A option and click it and just enter your question there. And if you're joining us by phone and you want to ask a question, you can just send an email to Rochelle at Fosna.org, R-O-C-H-E-L-L-E at F-O-S-N-A dot O-R-G. So thanks. So we have some questions coming in. Um, I'm thinking I will go ahead and maybe pose three. I'll read three and then um, you all can choose how you wanna respond to them from there. Um, so the first three that we are receiving are, um, is there a Christian Zionism within the Roman Catholic tradition? The second question is, what does Christian Zionism say about Christian Palestinians? And then thirdly, I feel that it is my duty as a Christian to call out Christian Zionism the most. Am I correct as a person who used to support this? So we'll start with those three questions. And um, yeah, please keep the questions coming in. Thanks. It sounds like some of those may be coming to me. <laughs> um, I, so I'll, I'll address the, uh, the Roman Catholic Christian Zionism piece first. There is a strong Roman Catholic Christian Zionism that came about primarily in the post-Holocaust, post-Vatican II era with the release of Nostra Aetate. There was a, a, a formulation of Catholic theology that recognized in, in very beginning ways in the 1960s as uh, Jewish Holocaust theologians like Elie Wiesel and Richard Rubenstein and, and uh, Yitz Greenberg developed their concepts of post-Holocaust theology there were many different Christians who came alongside them, many of them Roman Catholic, recognizing Western Christian complicity and anti-Semitism and the Shoah. So there, and some of those then developed into Christian Zionists who saw the state of Israel as some sort of uh, deified response to Jewish suffering. And so there are certainly uh, ex Catholic expressions of Christian Zionism there. There were other philo-Semitic forms of Catholicism before that era, but it was in that time that, that Christian Zionism became more crystallized in, in Roman Catholic communities. And there's still a huge battle internally in Roman Catholic communities about these questions. Uh, how do Christian Zionists view uh, Palestinian Christians? I think that um, well, one, of, one of the things that I would point out is a quote from a Canadian Christian Zionist named Paul Merkley, who happens to be a Lutheran, I'm a Lutheran, 
um, he says, he, he's writing about uh, the church leaders in Jerusalem. And this is in the early 2000s. And he says, uh, Lufti Laham is the Greek Catholic Archbishop. Riyad al Sal is the Anglican Bishop. Manib Yunan is the Lutheran Bishop. For a variety of reasons, the churches of the West, uh, oh, yeah, so that the, these leaders are no longer Europeans, but Arabs, points this out. And then he says that these churches of the West no longer regard themselves as churches of the West. That is, as defenders, let alone emissaries of what used to be called Christendom. So this sense that Europeanness is actually the uh, the key to Christian faithfulness it is present in that pers that racist perspective, and then you have a, um, a another piece where a Christian Zionist can rarely comprehend that a person can be a Christian and a Palestinian nationalist. Uh, because it doesn't make sense to them, it doesn't compute. But of course, what they, what a Christian Zionist doesn't recognize is that their Christian theological ideology is just as nationalist and just as ideologically driven as any nationalism of another sort. And so they, they think that what they have is true Christianity, what others have is a politicized form of Christianity and would never recognize that they are themselves politicized. But they, of course, have global power on their side. That always helps verify your theology rather well. And then um, I think, yes, it is, I would think, a primary responsibility for Christians to, to call out Christian Zionism, to challenge Christian Zionism. Uh, this is a very difficult concept because in doing so in the United States and in many parts of Europe, you're addressing part of the fabric of your culture itself. You're not just looking at some recent development. It's not an easily defeated movement, but we do have to address it. I would say though, that it's not just about addressing Christian Zionism, it's about addressing its underlying realities of anti-Semitism, of rejecting, uh, rejecting harmful philo-Semitism that constructs Jews for Christian purposes, or rejecting Islamophobia, uh, rejecting anti-Catholic thought. All of these pieces fit together, and uh, as we seek justice, not just for Palestinians, but justice that will liberate oppressors as well as those who are oppressed. And might I add, Christian Zionism fits very well with heteronormative uh, <laughs> fears, uh, with, with toxic masculinity, all of these expressions of imperial domination. Uh, so all of the, the, the many forms of oppression that we're called to stand against are bound up in Christian Zionism that stands alongside. And does someone else want to respond to the question about, um, as a Christian, is there a more specific duty to call out Christian Zionism specifically? Uh, and then I can ask, there's more questions rolling in quickly here. Well, as a Christian, <laughs> yes, absolutely. For all the things we've been talking about, uh, for all the things of how it interrelated with all other oppressions. Even, um, let me connect this question with the, the question about uh, how does Christian Zionism say about um, Palestinian Christians as myself. It's, we're made into extremes, meaning um, on the one hand, where either our existence is denied, whether as converts or whether as a marginal community, or also another extreme, our existence is sometimes hyper-represented. And it's hyper-represented in ways that progressive churches are actually sometimes acting out some Islamophobic and anti-Semitic frameworks. Um, and that's in, an, in, an, in, in, a, in a Zionist, Christian Zionist framework rather than an anti-Zionist framework. That's how it's all interrelated when we talk about even, even Christian um, Palestinians. Um, this is where we see those extremes are the same circles, whether it's a progressive church or whether it is, you know, the Christian Zionist that we see as extreme. Uh, both, all are dealing with Christian Zionism and, and all uh, relate to it, in a, uh, relate to us as Christian Palestinians from oppressive lenses. Thanks, Tarek. 
All right, so we have a little over 10 minutes left and I'll go ahead and uh, again, read three questions. I wanted to first respond to someone who asked specifically about was it HB Church? It's uh, HP Churches, HP Free Churches is the campaign that we run at FASA and in the chat, I put the link and we'll also um, be sending an email about that. And that's specific to Hewlett Packard companies who are complicit in the occupation in multiple ways. And it was a, it's a campaign we've launched to try to bring denominational decisions to divest from HP to the congregational level. So it's a way for your congregation to have these conversations and take action. So um, we'll send information about that. And the other projects that Tarek listed, we'll make sure to include in a follow-up email as well as Tally's presentation and the recording from this webinar. So questions, um, what do we call people who oppose Palestinian self-determination slash rights? Zionist, settler, colonialist, not Christian Zionist or Jewish Zionist? How do you lump those who are against Palestinians without creating another category of a monolithic stereotype? Um, another question, how would you suggest responding to articles that emphasize that anti-Semitism is growing in the UK labor movement and suggest that this is also happening in the US. And then third, um, critics of the BDS movement state that it is anti-Semitic and efforts to pass laws against participation and support of the movement are underway across the country. Is this a conflation of criticism of actions of the state of Israel with anti-Semitism? And if so, how can we respond? Or are there aspects that are being communicated in a way that is anti-Semitic? Three really good questions. Let's see what we can do with them in the last 10 minutes. Anyone want to jump in and start? Oh, give a, give it a, give a swing at some of those. Be excited to hear what other folks have to say. Um, I mean, I think the idea that um, BDS is anti-Semitic, I disagree with that, but BDS as a movement is anti-Semitic. Um, I think it's helpful to know, sometimes when people say that, they just mean any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Sometimes when people say BDS is anti-Semitic, they're specifically talking about um, the support for Palestinian right of return as something that would fundamentally and uh, challenge um, Israel's identity as a Jewish state. Um, and what I want to say, I think, I think that like having a, knowing for ourselves what actually, what anti-Semitism is and being able to say, here's how I understand the BDS call, here's what I understand anti-Semitism is, here's why I think that BDS is not anti-Semitic, but is a nonviolent movement, um, for freedom and justice for all. Um, and I think, I mean, this is, I, Sadly, most conversations about this don't actually get into the details of right of return for Palestinians and what would it mean um, for Jewish life in Israel-Palestine. If you have someone willing to like go there with you and talk about you know, like the details of that, um, that's great. Um, but I think the, um, the, the first line is to really know kind of like what is the BDF call um, and what and be able to say for yourself like, you know, Here's why I don't. Here's anti-Semitism is uh, violence and stereotypes against Jews based in European Christian domination. Um, here's why the BDS call is a movement of human rights, um, or whatever you would say about that. Yeah. So that's that's. I would love to hear other folks on that, or I know we have other questions, so maybe someone else will take a different one. Rochelle, could you uh, repeat the question about what do we call different people? What labels might we offer? Yes, so what do we call people who oppose Palestinian self-determination rights? Zionist question mark, settler colonialist question mark, not Christian Zionist or Jewish Zionist. How do you lump those who are against Palestinians without creating another category of a monolithic stereotype? I guess- I can try on that, oh, would you? No, please. I think that was based on something I said. So I, I mean, great question. I, I mean, I, I think what I want to say is that we can be specific if we're talking about the Israeli government is bombing Gaza, and I oppose the Israeli government doing that today. Or if we're talking about like 
XYZ organization in my town just did XYZ thing against Palestinian rights, like you, we can actually be more specific. Um, if we're talking about, I mean, if we're actually talking about all Jewish Zionists or all Christian Zionists or everyone who supports the state of Israel, like, um, I, I think it's just a, a like thinking and being more specific because of this trope or because uh, Jews all think this, Zionists all think this um, in a way that flattens. Um, yeah, I guess I'm not saying like never use those, but more kind of like think about what we're saying and, and try to be specific and strategic in how we're talking. Yeah, I want to just add a couple things. Um, I agree with everything that uh, um, Rabbi Jessica said, but um, I think the, uh, in addition to in, in thinking about what to call people who are against Palestinian human rights is, um, I'm not opposed to using the word Zionism or Zionist. One thing that I sort of uh, worry about sometimes is I just don't think people know what that means mostly. And so um, being more specific can help bring people in and be more clear about what it is that we're actually talking about. Um, and um, I uh, also wanted to speak to the, to the criticism of BDS. And I think, I don't know enough about the UK to fully answer this, but I think this might be relevant to the UK question. But sometimes um, part of what I think we didn't quite get to in this webinar, accusations of anti-Semitism are used to are, are weaponized against uh, people who advocate for Palestinian human rights. Um, and the folks who make those accusations will use true, you know, anti-Semitic um, uh, stereotypes and say that the people who are advocating for Palestinian rights are using those uh, stereotypes or using those tropes or using those themes. Um, so that's when it becomes in incredibly important for all of us to have a deep awareness of what anti-Semitism is so that we can be really clear amongst ourselves what it is that we're saying and how we're saying it. Um, so I'm thinking specifically about Ilhan Omar as, a, as like an example that is pretty well known at this point. She said something about um, this requirement that she felt as a, as a congressperson of um, pledging allegiance to, to the state of Israel, right? And, people took that phrase and said, she's saying that there's dual loyalties, um, that, that, that uh, Jews aren't ever fully loyal to the United States, right? And as I talked about, that is something that people say, in anti like, and you, that is an anti-Semitic thing to say, right? To say that Jewish people are not loyal to the US is an anti-Semitic thing to say. She did not say that, right? So I think that's when it becomes, you have to be very, very clear both okay, I understand that this is the accusation. I also understand what she said, and I understand the difference between those two things. Um, so BDS is, is one of those things where people, I've also heard, um, you know, you're, you're targeting the only Jewish state, right? And where is the BDS against Saudi Arabia or whatever the, the argument is? Um, and uh, there, I think it's really, you know, to be really clear that this is a call from Palestinian civil society, that we are responding to in solidarity um, and not sort of arbitrarily choosing uh, who to boycott um, as part of this campaign. Great, thank you, Tali. I think we're gonna stop there. Great questions continue to flow in and, um, and this is definitely not the end of this conversation for us at FAZA and we hope to have future webinars continuing this conversation. Um, we do plan to have a webinar in the next month and a half that'll focus on the 10 year anniversary of the Kairos Palestine document with members of Kairos Palestine. So definitely, again, become a member, make sure you get on our mailing list one way or another to get word of future webinars. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tarek now to close us out. Again, uh, yeah, thank you all so much, Tarek. Yeah, thanks, Rochelle. Just a couple of minutes and we will close it up here. Um, and for us internally, just to say, reflecting on, on this whole conversation and conversations we've had in the past um, and my metaphor of walking a path of justice, it's not that Fazna or I personally or people inside our constituency, we realize that we will continue to stumble and fall on weeds and along that path. So it's not saying we are looking at being perfect in walking that path as much as um, and, and understanding that it's not 
about not falling, but understanding about when we do fall, how do we best reach out to allies, which are represented here on this webinar, um, to help us uh, stand up and walk and continue in, in that rightful path. Um, and for me, again, as a Palestinian, to constantly remind myself and us of Palestine as an opportunity that helps us to destroy some of these systems of oppressions and that we can, and that this is a journey of justice, not an end goal of, of justice. So this work has to be done all throughout that journey. Uh, I think that's, that's what builds that community, uh, that beloved community, if you will, that we're seeking. Um, or an inclusive uh, vision of theology community, uh, to use Robert's words, non-supremacist, non-hierarchical structures. Um, where is that vision once we have deconstructed? Uh, where is that vision of constructing? Um, that freedom for the oppressor and the oppressed, which all of us are. We're all oppressors and we're all oppressed and interrelated um, in, in doing that. And I think it's along that path is, is where divinity reigns, is, is throughout that path. I'm thankful for um, you, Tali, Jessica, and Robert, for your sharing, for your energy, for your power, for coming onto this call and sharing a lot of yourself. I'm thankful for each of the participants, each one of you who have joined us and taken time to understand this. It is really important, and I think we are that much more powerful after such moments of truth as this webinar. Um, so it is an honor and privilege to be with our, with our speakers and with you all. Um, thank you. And we shall meet again soon on the journey. Rochelle, anything else or wrap it up? That's all. Thank you so much. And then all right. we'll follow up email with, uh, uh, with more. Yeah. Thank you all. Blessings. Bye-bye.